Story number 126 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Ferdinand the Faithful. Once on a time lived a man and a woman who, so long as they were rich, had no children. But when they were poor, they had a little boy. They could, however, find no godfather for him. So the man said he would just go to another place to see if he could get one there. As he went, a poor man met him, who asked him where he was going. He said he was going to see if he could get a godfather, that he was poor, so no one would stand as godfather for him. Oh, said the poor man, you are poor. I am poor. I will be godfather for you but I am so ill off I can give the child nothing. Go home and tell the nurse that she is to come to the church with the child. When they all got to the church together, the beggar was already there, and he gave the child the name of Ferdinand the Faithful. When he was going out of the church, the beggar said, Now go home. I can give you nothing, and you likewise ought to give me nothing. But he gave a key to the nurse, and told her when she got home she was to give it to the father who was to take care of it until the child was fourteen years old, and then he was to go on the heath where there was a castle which the key would fit, and that all which was therein should belong to him. Now when the child was seven years old and had grown up very big, he once went to play with some other boys, and each of them boasted that he had got more from his godfather than the other. But the child could say nothing and was vexed, and went home and said to his father, did I get nothing at all then from my godfather? Oh, yes, said the father. Thou hadst a key. If there is a castle standing on the heath, just go to it and open it. Then the boy went thither, but no castle was to be seen or heard of. After seven years more, when he was fourteen years old, he again went thither, and there stood the castle. When he had opened it, there was nothing within but a horse, a white one. Then the boy was so full of joy because he had a horse, that he mounted on it and galloped back to his father. Now I have a white horse, and I will travel, said he. So he set out, and as he was on his way, a pen was lying on the road. At first he thought he would pick it up, but then again he thought to himself, Thou shouldest leave it lying there. Thou wilt easily find a pen where thou art going, if thou hast need of one. As he was thus riding away, a voice called after him, Ferdinand the Faithful, take it with thee. He looked around, but saw no one. Then he went back again and picked it up. When he had ridden a little way farther, he passed a lake, and a fish was lying on the bank, gasping and panting for breath. So he said, Wait, my dear fish, I will help thee get into the water. And he took hold of it by the tail and threw it into the lake. Then the fish put its head out of the water and said, As thou hast helped me out of the mud, I will give thee a flute, when thou art in any need. Play on it, and then I will help thee. And if ever thou lettest anything fall in the water, just play it, and I will reach it out to thee. Then he rode away, and there came to him a man who asked him where he was going. Oh, to the next place. Then what his name was? Ferdinand the Faithful. So then, we have got almost the same name. I am called Ferdinand the Unfaithful. And they both set out to the inn in the nearest place. Now it was unfortunate that Ferdinand the Unfaithful knew everything that the other had ever thought, and everything he was about to do. He knew it by means of all kinds of wicked arts. There was, however, in the inn an honest girl, who had a bright face and behaved very prettily. She fell in love with Ferdinand the Faithful because he was a handsome man, and she asked him whither he was going. Oh, I am just traveling round about, said he. Then she said he ought to stay there, for the king of that country wanted an attendant or an outrider, and he ought to enter his service. He answered he could not very well go to any one like that and offer himself. Then said the maiden, Oh, but I will soon do it for you. And so she went straight to the king, and told him that she knew of an excellent servant for him. He was well pleased with that, and had Ferdinand the Faithful brought to him, and wanted to make him his servant. 
He, however, liked better to be an outrider, for where his horse was, there he also wanted to be. So the king made him an outrider. When Ferdinand the Unfaithful learnt that, he said to the girl, What? Dost thou help him, and not me? Oh, said the girl, I will help thee too. She thought, I must keep friends with that man, for he is not to be trusted. She went to the king and offered him as a servant, and the king was willing. Now when the king met his lords in the morning, he always lamented and said, Oh, if I had but my love with me. Ferdinand the Unfaithful was, however, always hostile to Ferdinand the Faithful. So once, when the king was complaining thus, he said, You have the outrider, send him away to get her, and if he does not do it, his head must be struck off. Then the king sent for Ferdinand the Faithful, and told him that there was, in this place, or in that place, a girl he loved, and that he was to bring her to him, and if he did not do it, he should die. Ferdinand the Faithful went into the stable to his white horse, and complained and lamented, Oh, what an unhappy man I am! Then someone behind him cried, Ferdinand the Faithful, why weepest thou? He looked round, but saw no one, and went on lamenting, Oh, my dear little white horse, now must I leave thee, now must I die. Then someone cried once more, Ferdinand the Faithful, why weepest thou? Then for the first time he was aware that it was his little white horse who was putting that question. Dost thou speak, my little white horse? Canst thou do that? And again he said, I am to go to this place and to that, and am to bring the bride. Canst thou tell me how I am to set about it? Then answered the little white horse, Go thou to the king, and say, If he will give thou what thou must have, thou wilt get her for him. If he will give thee a ship full of meat, and a ship full of bread, it will succeed. Great giants dwell on the lake, and if thou takest no meat with thee for them, they will tear thee to pieces. And there are the large birds, which would pick the eyes out of thy head, if thou hadst no bread for them. Then the king made all the butchers in the land kill, and all the bakers bake, that the ships might be filled. When they were full, the little white horse said to Ferdinand the Faithful, now mount me, and go with me into the ship, and then when the giants come, say, Peace, peace, my dear little giants, I have had thought of ye, something I have brought for ye, and when the birds come, thou shalt again say, Peace, peace, my dear little birds, I have had thought of ye, something I have brought for ye, then they will do nothing to thee, and when thou comest to the castle, the giants will help thee. Then go up to the castle, and take a couple of giants with thee. There the princess lies sleeping. Thou must, however, not awaken her. But the giants must lift her up, and carry her in her bed to the ship. And when everything took place as the little white horse had said, and Ferdinand the Faithful gave the giants and the birds what he had brought with him for them, and that made the giants willing, and they carried the princess in her bed to the king. And when she came to the king, she said she could not live, she must have her writings, they had been left in her castle. Then, by the instigation of Ferdinand the Unfaithful, Ferdinand the Faithful is called, and the king told him he must fetch the writings from the castle, or he should die. Then he went once more into the stable, and bemoaned himself, and said, O oh, my dear little white horse, now I am to go away again, how am I to do it? And the little white horse said, he was just to load the ships full again, so it happened again as it had happened before, and the giants and the birds were satisfied, and made gentle by the meat. When they came to the castle, the white horse told Ferdinand the Faithful that he must go in, and that on the table in the princess's bedroom lay the writings, and Ferdinand the Faithful went in and fetched them. When they were on the lake, he let his pen fall into the water. Then said the white horse, now I cannot help thee at all. But he remembered his flute, and began to play on it. And the fish came with a pen in its mouth, and gave it to him. So he took the writings to the castle where the wedding was celebrated. The queen, however, did not love the king, because he had no nose, but she would have much liked to love Ferdinand the Faithful. Once, therefore, when all the lords of the court were together, 
the queen said she could do feats of magic that she could cut off anyone's head and put it on again and that one of them ought just to try it but none of them would be the first so ferdinand the faithful again at the instigation of ferdinand the unfaithful undertook it and she hewed off his head and put it on again for him and they healed together directly so that it looked as if it had a red thread round his throat then the king said to her my child and where hast thou learnt that yes she said i understand the art shall i just try it on thee also oh yes said he but she cut off his head and did not put it on again but pretended that she could not get it on and that it would not keep fixed then the king was buried but she married ferdinand the faithful he however always rode on his white horse and once when he was seated on it it told him that he was to go on to the heath which he knew and gallop three times around it and when he had done that the white horse stood up on its hind legs and was changed into a king's son end of story one twenty six story one twenty seven of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melvin lee household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt the iron stove in the days when wishing was still of some use a king's son was bewitched by an old witch and shut up in an iron stove in a forest there he passed many years and no one could deliver him then a king's daughter came into the forest who had lost herself and could not find her father's kingdom again after she had wandered about for nine days she at length came to the iron stove then a voice came forth from it and asked her whence comest thou and whither goest thou she answered i have lost my father's kingdom and cannot get home again then a voice inside the iron stove said i will help thee to get home again and that indeed most swiftly if thou wilt promise to do what i desire of thee i am the son of a far greater king than thy father and i will marry thee then was she afraid and thought good heavens what can i do with an iron stove but as she much wished to get home to her father she promised to do as he desired but he said thou shalt return here and bring a knife with thee and scrape a hole in the iron then he gave her a companion who walked near her but did not speak but in two hours he took her home there was a great joy in the castle when the king's daughter came home and the old king fell on her neck and kissed her she however was sorely troubled and said dear father what i have suffered i should never have got home again from the great wild forest if i had not come to an iron stove but i have been forced to give my word that i will go back to it set it free and marry it then the old king was so terrified that he all but fainted for he had but this one daughter they therefore resolved they would send in her place the miller's daughter who was very beautiful they took her there gave her a knife and said she was to scrape at the iron stove so she scraped at it for four and twenty hours but could not bring off the least morsel of it when the day dawned a voice in the stove said it seems to me it is day outside then she answered it seems so to me too i fancy i hear the noise of my father's mill so thou art a miller's daughter then go thy way at once and let the king's daughter come here then she went away at once and told the old king that the man outside there would have none of her he wanted the king's daughter they however still had a swineherd's daughter who was even prettier than the miller's daughter and they determined to give her a piece of gold to go to the iron stove instead of the king's daughter so she was taken thither and she also had to scrape for four and twenty hours she however made nothing of it when day broke a voice inside the stove cried 
it seems to me it is day outside then answered she so it seems to me also i fancy i hear my father's horn blowing then thou art a swineherd's daughter go away at once and tell the king's daughter to come and tell her all must be done as promised and if she does not come everything the kingdom shall be ruined and destroyed and not one stone be left standing on another when the king's daughter heard that she began to weep but now there was nothing for it but to keep her promise so she took leave of her father put a knife in her pocket and went forth to the iron stove in the forest when she got there she began to scrape and the iron gave way and when two hours were over she had already scraped a small hole then she peeped in and saw a youth so handsome and so brilliant with gold and with precious jewels that her very soul was delighted now therefore she went on scraping and made the hole so large that he was able to get out then said he thou art mine and i am thine thou art my bride and hast released me he wanted to take her away with him to his kingdom but she entreated him to let her go once again to her father and the king's son allowed her to do so but she was not to say more to her father than three words and then she was to come back again so she went home but she spoke more than three words and instantly the iron stove disappeared and was taken far away over glass mountains and piercing swords but the king's son was set free and no longer shut up in it after this she bade good-bye to her father took some money with her but not much and went back to the great forest and looked for the iron stove but it was nowhere to be found for nine days she sought it and then her hunger grew so great that she did not know what to do for she could no longer live when it was evening she seated herself in a small tree and made up her mind to spend the night there as she was afraid of wild beasts when midnight drew near she saw in the distance a small light and thought ah there i should be saved she got down from the tree and went towards the light but on the way she prayed then she came to a little old house and much grass had grown all about it and a small heap of wood lay in front of it she thought ah whither have i come and peeped in through the window but she saw nothing inside but toads big and little except a table well covered with wine and roast meat and the plates and glasses were of silver then she took courage and knocked at the door the fat toad cried little green waiting maid waiting maid with limping leg little dog of limping leg hop hither and thither and quickly see who is without and a small toad came walking by and opened the door to her when she entered they all bade her welcome and she was forced to sit down they asked where hast thou come from and whither art thou going and she related all that had befallen her and how because she had transgressed the order which had been given to her not to say more than three words the stove and the king's son also had disappeared and now she was about to seek him over hill and dale until she found him then the old fat one said little green waiting maid waiting maid with limping leg little dog of limping leg hop hither and thither and bring me the great box then the little one went and brought the box after this they gave her meat and drink and took her to a well-made bed which felt like silk and velvet and she laid herself therein in god's name and slept when morning came she arose and the old toad gave her three needles out of the great box which she was to take with her they would be needed by her for she had to cross a high glass mountain and go over three piercing swords and a great lake if she did all this she would get her lover back again then she gave her three things which she was to take the greatest care of namely three large needles a plough wheel and three nuts with these she travelled onwards and when she came to the glass mountain which was so slippery she stuck the three needles first behind her feet and then before them and so got over it and when she was over it 
she hid them in a place which she marked carefully after this she came to the three piercing swords and then she seated herself on her plough wheel and rolled over them at last she arrived in front of a great lake and when she had crossed it she came to a large and beautiful castle she went in and asked for a place she was a poor girl she said and would like to be hired she knew however that the king's son whom she had released from the iron stove in the great forest was in the castle then she was taken as a scullery maid at low wages but already the king's son had another maiden by his side whom he wanted to marry for he thought that she had long been dead in the evening when she had washed up and was done she felt in her pocket and found the three nuts which the old toad had given her she cracked one with her teeth and was going to eat the kernel when lo and behold there was a stately royal garment in it but when the bride heard of this she came and asked for the dress and wanted to buy it and said it is not a dress for a servant girl but she said no she would not sell it but if the bride would grant her one thing she should have it and that was leave to sleep one night in her bridegroom's chamber the bride gave her permission because the dress was so pretty and she had never had one like it when it was evening she said to her bridegroom that silly girl will sleep in thy room if thou art willing so am i said he she however gave him a glass of wine in which she had poured a sleeping draught so the bridegroom and the scullery maid went to sleep in the room and he slept so soundly that she could not waken him she wept the whole night and cried i set thee free when thou wert in an iron stove in the wild forest i sought thee and walked over a glass mountain and three sharp swords and a great lake before i found thee and yet thou wilt not hear me the servant sat by the chamber door and heard how she thus wept the whole night through and in the morning they told it to their lord and the next evening when she had washed up she opened the second nut and a far more beautiful dress was in it and when the bride beheld it she wished to buy that also but the girl would not take money and begged that she might once again sleep in the bridegroom's chamber the bride however gave him a sleeping drink and he slept so soundly that he could hear nothing but the scullery maid wept the whole night long and cried i set thee free when thou wert in an iron stove in the wild forest i sought thee and walked over a glass mountain and over three sharp swords and a great lake before i found thee and yet thou wilt not hear me the servant sat by the chamber door and heard her weeping the whole night through and in the morning informed their lord of it on the third evening when she had washed up she opened the third nut and within it was a still more beautiful dress which was stiff with pure gold when the bride saw that she wanted to have it but the maiden only gave it up on condition that she might for the third time sleep in the bridegroom's apartment the king's son was however on his guard and threw the sleeping draught away now therefore when she began to weep and to cry dearest love i set thee free when thou wert in the iron stove in the terrible wild forest the king's son leapt up and said thou art the true one thou art mine and i am thine thereupon while it was still night he got into a carriage with her and they took away the false bride's clothes so that she could not get up when they came to the great lake they sailed across it and when they reached the three sharp cutting swords they seated themselves on the plough wheel and when they got to the glass mountain they thrust the three needles in it and so at length they got to the little old house but when they went inside that it was a great castle and the toads were all disenchanted and were king's children and full of happiness then the wedding was celebrated and the king's son and the princess remade in the castle which was much larger than the castles of their fathers as however the old king grieved at being left alone. They fetched him away, and brought him to live with them. They had two kingdoms, and lived in happy wedlock. A mouse did run. This story is done. 
End of Story 127《Story 128 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Lazy Spinner In a certain village there once lived a man and his wife, and the wife was so idle that she would never work at anything, Whatever her husband gave her to spin, she did not get done, and what she did spin, she did not wind, but let it all remain entangled in a heap. If the man scolded her, she was always ready with her tongue and said, Well, how should I wind it when I have no reel? Just you go into the forest and get me one. If that is all, said the man, then I will go into the forest and get some wood for making reels. Then the woman was afraid that if he had the wood he would make her a reel of it, and she would have to wind her yarn off, and then begin to spin again. She bethought herself a little, and then a lucky idea occurred to her, and she secretly followed the man into the forest, and when he had climbed into a tree to choose and cut the wood, she crept into the thicket below, where he could not see her, and cried, He who cuts wood for reel shall die, and he who winds shall perish. The man listened, laid down his axe for a moment, and began to consider what that could mean. Hello, he said at last. What can that have been? My ears must have been singing. I won't alarm myself for nothing. So he again seized the axe and began to hew. Then again there came a cry from below. He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who winds shall perish. He stopped and felt afraid and alarmed, and pondered over the circumstance. But when a few moments had passed, he took heart again, and a third time he stretched out his hand for the axe, and began to cut. But someone called out a third time, and said loudly, He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who winds shall perish. That was enough for him, and all inclination had departed from him, so he hastily descended the tree, and set out on his way home. The woman ran as fast as she could by byways so as to get home first. So when he entered the parlour, she put on an innocent look as if nothing had happened, and said, Well, have you brought a nice piece of wood for reels? No, said he, I see very well that winding won't do, and told her what had happened to him in the forest, and from that time forth left her in peace about it. Nevertheless, after some time, the man again began to complain of the disorder in the house. Wife, said he, it is really a shame that the spun yarn should lie there all entangled. I'll tell you what, said she, as we still don't come by any reel, you go up into the loft, and I will stand down below, and will throw the yarn up to you, and you will throw it down to me, and so we shall get a skein after all. Yes, that will do, said the man. So they did that, and when it was done, he said, the yarn is in skeins, now it must be boiled. The woman was again distressed. She certainly said, Yes, we will boil it next morning early. But she was secretly contriving another trick. Early in the morning she got up, lighted a fire, and put the kettle on. Only instead of the yarn she put in a lump of tow and let it boil. After that she went to the man, who was still lying in bed, and said to him, I must just go out. You must get up and look after the yarn which is in the kettle on the fire but you must be at hand at once. Mind that, for if the cock should happen to crow, and you are not attending to the yarn, it will become tow. The man was willing, and took good care not to loiter. He got up as quickly as he could and went into the kitchen, but when he reached the kettle and peeped in, he saw to his horror nothing but a lump of tow. Then the poor man was as still as a mouse thinking he had neglected it and was to blame, and in future said no more about yarn and spinning. But you yourself must own she was an odious woman. End of story 128。story 129 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Boat Harbor, Houston, Texas. 
Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, translated by Margaret Hunt. The Four Skillful Brothers There was once a poor man who had four sons, and when they were grown up he said to them, My dear children, you must now go out into the world, for I have nothing to give you. So set out, and go to some distance, and learn a trade, and see how you can make your way. So the four brothers took their sticks, bade their father farewell, and went through the town gate together. When they had traveled for some time, they came to a crossway which branched off in four different directions. Then said the eldest, Here we must separate, but on this day four years we will meet each other again at this spot, and in the meantime we will seek our fortunes. Then each of them went his way, and the eldest met a man who asked him where he was going and what was he intending to do i want to learn a trade he replied then the other said come with me and be a thief no he answered that is no longer regarded as a reputable trade and the end of it is that one has to swing on the gallows oh said the man you need not be afraid of the gallows i will only teach you to get such things as no other man could ever lay hold of and no one will ever detect you so he allowed himself to be talked into it and while with the man became an accomplished thief and so dexterous that nothing was safe from him if he once desired to have it the second brother met a man who put the same question to him what he wanted to learn in the world i don't know yet he replied then come with me and be an astronomer there is nothing better than that for nothing is hid from you he liked the idea and became such a skilful astronomer that when he had learnt everything and was about to travel onwards his master gave him a telescope and said to him with that you canst thou see whatsoever takes place either on earth or in heaven and nothing can remain concealed from thee a huntsman took the third brother into training and gave him such excellent instruction in everything which related to huntsmanship that he became an experienced hunter when he went away his master gave him a gun and said it will never fail you whatsoever you aim at you are certain to hit the youngest brother also met a man who spoke to him and inquired what his intentions were would you not like to be a tailor said he not that i know of said the youth sitting doubled up from morning till night driving the needle and the goose backwards and forwards is not to my taste oh but you are speaking in ignorance answered the man with me you would learn a very different kind of tailoring which is respectable and proper and for the most part very honourable so he let himself be persuaded and went with the man and learnt his art from the very beginning when they parted the man gave the youth a needle and said with this you can sew together whatever is given you whether it is as soft as an egg or as hard as steel it will all become one piece of stuff so that no seam will be visible when the appointed four years were over the four brothers arrived at the same time at the crossroads embraced and kissed each other and returned home to their father so now said he quite delighted the wind has blown you back again to me they told him of all that had happened to them and that each had learned his own trade now they were sitting just in front of the house under a large tree and the father said i will put you all to the test and see what you can do then he looked up and said to his second son between two branches up at the top of this tree there is a chaffinch's nest tell me how many eggs are in it the astronomer took his glass looked up and said there are five then the father said to the eldest fetch the eggs down without disturbing the bird which is sitting hatching them the skilful thief climbed up and took the five eggs from beneath the bird which never observed what he was doing and remained quietly sitting where she was and brought them down to his father the father took them and put one of them on each corner of the table and the fifth in the middle and said to the huntsman with one shot thou shalt shoot me the five eggs in two through the middle the huntsman aimed and shot the eggs all five as the father had desired and that at one shot he certainly must have had some of the power for shooting round corners now it's your turn said the father of the fourth son you shall sew the eggs together again and the young birds that are inside them as well and you must do it so that they are not hurt by the shot 
the tailor brought his needle and sewed them as his father wished when he had done this the thief had to climb up the tree again and carry them to the nest and put them back again under the bird without her being aware of it the bird sat her full time and after a few days the young ones crept out and they had a red line round their necks where they had been sewn together by the tailor well said the old man to his sons i begin to think you are worth more than breen clover you have used your time well and learnt something good i can't say which of you deserves the most praise that will be proved if you have but an early opportunity of using your talents not long after this there was a great uproar in the country for the king's daughter was carried off by a dragon the king was full of trouble about it both by day and night and caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever brought her back should have her to wife the four brothers said to each other this would be a fine opportunity for us to show what we can do and resolved to go forth together and liberate the king's daughter i will soon know where she is said the astronomer and looked through his telescope and said i see her already she is far away from here on a rock in the sea and the dragon is beside her watching her then he went to the king and asked for a ship for himself and his brothers and sailed with them over the sea until they came to a rock there the king's daughter was sitting and the dragon was lying asleep on her lap the huntsman said i dare not fire i should kill the beautiful maiden at the same time then i will try my art said the thief and he crept thither and stole her away from under the dragon so quietly and dexterously that the monster never remarked it but went on snoring full of joy they hurried off with her on board ship and steered out into the open sea but the dragon who when he awoke found no princess there followed them and came snorting angrily through the air just as he was circling above the ship and about to descend on it the huntsman shouldered his gun and shot him in the heart the monster fell down dead but was so large and powerful that his fall shattered the whole ship fortunately however they laid hold of a couple of planks and swam about the wide sea then again they were in great peril but the tailor who was not idle took his wondrous needle and with a few stitches sewed the planks together and they seated themselves upon them and collected together all the fragments of the vessel then he sewed these so skilfully together that in a very short time the ship was once more seaworthy and they could go home again in safety when the king once more saw his daughter there were great rejoicings he said to the four brothers one of you shall have her to wife but which of you it is to be you must settle among yourselves then a warm contest arose among them for each of them preferred his own claim the astronomer said if i had not seen the princess all your arts would have been useless so she is mine the thief said what would have been the use of your seeing if i had not got her away from the dragon so she is mine the huntsman said you and the princess and all of you would have been torn to pieces by the dragon if my ball had not hit him so she is mine the tailor said and if i by my art had not sewn the ship together again you would all of you have been miserably drowned so she is mine then the king uttered this saying each of you has an equal right and as all of you cannot have the maiden none of you shall have her but i will give to each of you a, as a reward half a kingdom the brothers were pleased with this decision and said it is better thus than that we should be at variance with each other then each of them received half a kingdom and they lived with their father in the greatest happiness as long as it pleased god end of story one hundred twenty nine Story 130 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. One Eye, Two Eyes, and Three Eyes. There was once a woman who had three daughters the eldest of whom was called one eye because she had only one eye in the middle of her forehead and the second two eyes because she had two eyes like other folks and the youngest three eyes because she had three eyes and her third eye was also in the centre of her forehead 
However, as Two Eyes saw just as other human beings did, her sisters and her mother could not endure her. They said to her, Thou with thy two eyes art no better than the common people. Thou dost not belong to us. They pushed her about and threw old clothes to her and gave her nothing to eat but what they left and did everything they could to make her unhappy. It came to pass that two eyes had to go out into the fields and tend the goat, but she was still quite hungry because her sisters had given her so little to eat. So she sat down on a ridge and began to weep, and so bitterly that two streams ran down from her eyes. And once, when she looked up in her grief, a woman was standing beside her, who said, Why art thou weeping, little Two Eyes? Two Eyes answered, Have I not reason to weep, when I have two eyes like other people, and my sisters and mother hate me for it, and push me from one corner to another, throw old clothes at me, and give me nothing to eat but the scraps they leave? Today they have given me so little that I am still quite hungry. Then the wise woman said, Wipe away thy tears, two eyes, and I will tell thee something to stop thee ever suffering from hunger again. Just say to thy goat, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And then a clean, well-spread little table will stand before thee, with the most delicious food upon it, of which thou mayst eat as much as thou art inclined for. And when thou hast had enough, and hast no more need of the little table, just say, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away, and then it will vanish again from thy sight. Hereupon the wise woman departed, but Two Eyes thought, I must instantly make a trial and see if what she said is true, for I am far too hungry. And she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat, cover the table with something to eat. And scarcely had she spoken the words than a little table covered with a white cloth was standing there, and on it was a plate with a knife and fork and a silver spoon, and the most delicious food was there also, warm and smoking as if it had just come out of the kitchen. Then Two Eyes said the shortest prayer she knew, Lord God, be with us always, Amen, and helped herself to some food and enjoyed it. And when she was satisfied, she said, as the wise woman had taught her, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And immediately the little table and everything on it was gone again. That is a delightful way of keeping house, thought Two Eyes, and was quite glad and happy. In the evening, when she went home with her goat, she found a small earthenware dish with some food, which her sisters had set ready for her, but she did not touch it. Next day, she again went out with her goat, and left the few bits of broken bread which had been handed to her, lying untouched. The first and second time that she did this, her sisters did not remark it at all, but as it happened every time, they did observe it, and said, There is something wrong about Two Eyes. She always leaves her food untasted, and she used to eat up everything that was given her. She must have discovered other ways of getting food. In order that they might learn the truth, they resolved to send one eye with two eyes when she went to drive her goat to the pasture, to observe what two eyes did when she was there, and whether any one brought her anything to eat and drink. So when two eyes set out the next time, one eye went to her and said, I will go with you to the pasture and see that the goat is well taken care of, and driven where there is food. But two eyes knew what was in one eye's mind, and drove the goat into high grass and said, Come, One Eye, we will sit down, and I will sing something to you. One Eye sat down, and was tired with the unaccustomed walk and the heat of the sun, and Two Eyes sang constantly, One Eye, wakest thou? One Eye, sleepest thou? Until One Eye shut her one eye, and fell asleep, and as soon as Two Eyes saw that One Eye was fast asleep and could discover nothing, she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat and seated herself at her table, and ate and drank until she was satisfied, and then she again cried, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And in an instant all was gone. Two eyes now awakened one eye, and said, One eye, you want to take care of the goat, and go to sleep while you are doing it, and in the meantime the goat might run all over the world. Come, let us go home again. So they went home, and again Two Eyes let her little dish stand untouched, and One Eye could not tell her mother why she would not eat it, and to excuse herself said, I fell asleep when I was out. 
Next day the mother said to Three Eyes, This time thou shalt go and observe if Two Eyes eats anything when she is out, and if any one fetches her food and drink, for she must eat and drink in secret. So Three Eyes went to Two Eyes and said, I will go with you and see if the goat is taken proper care of and driven where there is food. But Two Eyes knew what was in Three Eyes' mind, and drove the goat into high grass and said, We will sit down, and I will sing something to you, Three Eyes. Three Eyes sat down and was tired with the walk and with the heat of the sun, and Two Eyes began the same song as before, and sang, Three Eyes, are you waking? But then, instead of singing, Three Eyes, are you sleeping? As she ought to have done, she thoughtlessly sang, Two Eyes, are you sleeping? and sang all the time, Three eyes are you waking? Two eyes are you sleeping? Then two of the eyes which three eyes had shut and fell asleep, but the third, as it had not been named in the song, did not sleep. It is true that three eyes shut it, but only in her cunning to pretend it was asleep too, but it blinked and could see everything very well, and when two eyes thought that three eyes was fast asleep, she used her little charm. Bleat, my little goat, bleat! cover the table with something to eat, and ate and drank as much as her heart desired, and then ordered the table to go away again. Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And Three Eyes had seen everything. Then Two Eyes came to her, waked her, and said, Have you been asleep, Three Eyes? You are a good caretaker. Come, we will go home. And when they got home, Two Eyes again did not eat, and Three Eyes said to the mother, now I know why that high-minded thing there does not eat. When she is out, she says to the goat, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And then a little table appears before her, covered with the best of food, much better than any we have here. And when she has eaten all she wants, she says, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And all disappears. I watched everything closely. She put two of my eyes to sleep by using a certain form of words, but luckily the one in my forehead kept awake. Then the envious mother cried, Dost thou want to fare better than we do? The desire shall pass away. And she fetched a butcher's knife and thrust it into the heart of the goat, which fell down dead. When two eyes saw that, she went out full of trouble, seated herself on the ridge of grass at the edge of the field, and wept bitter tears. Suddenly the wise woman once more stood by her side and said, Two eyes, why art thou weeping? Have I not reason to weep, she answered. The goat which covered the table for me every day when I spoke your charm has been killed by my mother, and now I shall again have to bear hunger and want. The wise woman said, Two eyes, I will give thee a piece of good advice. Ask thy sisters to give thee the entrails of the slaughtered goat, and bury them in the ground in front of the house, and thy fortune will be made. Then she vanished, and Two Eyes went home and said to her sisters, Dear sisters, do give me some part of my goat. I do not wish for what is good, but give me the entrails. Then they laughed and said, If that is all you want, you can have it. So Two Eyes took the entrails and buried them quietly in the evening in front of the house door, as the wise woman had counseled her to do. Next morning, when they all awoke and went to the house door, there stood a strangely magnificent tree with leaves of silver and fruit of gold hanging among them, so that in all the wide world there was nothing more beautiful or precious. They did not know how the tree could have come there during the night, but Two Eyes saw that it had grown up out of the entrails of the goat, for it was standing on the exact spot where she had buried them. Then the mother said to One Eye, Climb up, my child, and gather some of the fruit of the tree for us. One Eye climbed up, but when she was about to get hold of one of the golden apples, the branch escaped from her hands, and that happened each time, so that she could not pluck a single apple, let her do what she might. Then said the mother, Three Eyes, do you climb up? You, with your three eyes, can look about you better than one eye. One eye slipped down, and three eyes climbed up. Three eyes was not more skillful, and might search as she liked, but the golden apples always escaped her. At length the mother grew impatient and climbed up herself, but could get hold of the fruit no better than one eye and three eyes, for she always clutched empty air. 
Then said Two Eyes, I will just go up. Perhaps I may succeed better. The sisters cried, You indeed with your two eyes, what can you do? But Two Eyes climbed up, and the golden apples did get out of her way, but came into her hand of their own accord, so that she could pluck them one after the other, and brought a whole apron full down with her. The mother took them away from her, and instead of treating poor Two Eyes any better for this, she and One Eye and Three Eyes were only envious, because Two Eyes alone had been able to get the fruit, and they treated her still more cruelly. It so befell that once, when they were all standing together by the tree, a young knight came up. "'Quick, Two Eyes,' cried the two sisters, "'creep under this, and don't disgrace us.' and with all speed they turned an empty barrel which was standing close by the tree over poor two eyes and they pushed the golden apples which she had been gathering under it too when the knight came nearer he was a handsome lord who stopped and admired the magnificent gold and silver tree and said to the two sisters to whom does this fine tree belong any one who would bestow one branch of it on me might in return for it ask whatsoever he desired then one eye and three eyes replied that the tree belonged to them, and that they would give him a branch. They both took great trouble, but they were not able to do it, for the branches and fruit both moved away from them every time. Then said the knight, It is very strange that the tree should belong to you, and that you should still not be able to break a piece off. They again asserted that the tree was their property. Whilst they were saying so, two eyes rolled out a couple of golden apples from under the barrel to the feet of the knight, for she was vexed with one eye and three eyes for not speaking the truth. When the knight saw the apples, he was astonished and asked where they came from. One eye and three eyes answered that they had another sister, who was not allowed to show herself, for she had only two eyes, like any common person. The knight, however, desired to see her and cried, Two eyes, come forth. Then Two Eyes, quite comforted, came from beneath the barrel, and the knight was surprised at her great beauty, and said, Thou, Two Eyes, canst certainly break off a branch from the tree for me? Yes, replied Two Eyes, that I certainly shall be able to do, for the tree belongs to me. And she climbed up, and with the greatest ease, broke off a branch with beautiful silver leaves and golden fruit, and gave it to the knight. Then said the knight, Two Eyes, what shall I give thee for it? Alas, answered Two Eyes, I suffer from hunger and thirst, grief and want, from early morning till late night. If you would take me with you, and deliver me from these things, I should be happy. So the knight lifted Two Eyes on to his horse, and took her home with him to his father's castle, and there he gave her beautiful clothes, and meat and drink to her heart's content, and as he loved her so much, he married her and the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicing. When Two Eyes was thus carried away by the handsome knight, her two sisters grudged her good fortune in downright earnest. The wonderful tree, however, still remains with us, thought they, and even if we can gather no fruit from it, still every one will stand still and look at it and come to us and admire it. Who knows what good things may be in store for us? But next morning the tree had vanished, and all their hopes were at an end. And when Two Eyes looked out of the window of her own little room, to her great delight it was standing in front of it, and so it had followed her. Two Eyes lived a long time in happiness. Once two poor women came to her in her castle and begged for alms. She looked in their faces and recognized her sisters, one eye and three eyes, who had fallen into such poverty that they had to wander about and beg their bread from door to door. Two eyes, however, made them welcome, and was kind to them, and took care of them, so that they both, with all their hearts, repented the evil that they had done their sister in their youth. End of story 130「Story 131 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roktai Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt 
Fair Catrinelle and Piff Paff Poultry. Good day, Father Holente. Many thanks, Piff Paff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes, if Mother Malcho, Milch Cow, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Käsetraut and Fair Katrinelje are willing, you can have her. Where is Mother Malcho then? She's in the cow house, milking the cow. Good day, Mother Malcho. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Käsetraut and Fair Katrinelje are willing, you can have her. Where is Brother High and Mighty, then? He's in the room, chopping some wood. Good day, Brother High and Mighty. Many thanks, Piff Paff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Sister Käsetraut, and Fair Katrinelje are willing, you can have her. Where is Sister Käsetraut, then? She's in the garden, cutting cabbages. Good day, Sister Käsetraut. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty, and Fair Katrinelje are willing, you may have her. Where is Fair Katrinelje, then? She's in the room counting out her farthings. Good day, Fair Katrinelje. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. Wilt thou be my bride? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty, and Sister Käsetraut are willing, I am ready. Fair Katrinelje, how much dowry do hast thou? Fourteen farthings in ready money, three and a half groschen owing to me, half a pound of dried apples, a handful of fried bread, and a handful of spices. And many other things are mine. Have I not a dowry fine? Piff puff poultry, what is thy trade? Art thou a tailor? Something better. A shoemaker? Something better. A husbandman? Something better. A joiner? Something better. A smith? Something better. A miller? Something better. Perhaps a broommaker? Yes, that's what I am. Is it not a fine trade? End of story 131。story 132 of household tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, translated by Margaret Hunt. The Fox and the Horse. A peasant had a faithful horse which had grown old and could do no more work. So his master would no longer give him anything to eat, and said, "I can certainly make no more use of thee, but still I mean well by thee. If thou provest thyself still strong enough to bring me a lion here, I will maintain thee. But now take thyself away out of my stable." And with that he chased him into the open country. The horse was sad, and went to the forest to seek a little protection there from the weather. Then the fox met him and said. Why dost thou hang thy head so, and go about all alone? Alas! Replied the horse, avarice and fidelity do not dwell together in one house. My master has forgotten what services I have performed for him for so many years, and because I can no longer plough well, he will give me no more food, and has driven me out. Without giving thee a chance, asked the fox. The chance was a bad one. He said, if I was still strong enough to bring him a lion, he would keep me. But he well knows that I cannot do that. The fox said, I will help thee. Just lay thyself down, stretch thyself out, as if thou were dead, and do not stir. The horse did as the fox desired, and the fox went to the lion, who had his den not far off, and said, "A dead horse is lying outside there. Just come with me; thou canst have a rich meal." The lion went with him, 
and when they were both standing by the horse the fox said after all it is not very comfortable for thee here i tell thee what i will fasten it to thee by the tail and then thou canst drag it into thy cave and devour it in peace this advice pleased the lion he lay down and in order that the fox might tie the horse fast to him he kept quite quiet but the fox tied the lion's legs together with the horse's tail and twisted and fastened all so well and so strongly that no strength could break it when he had finished his work he tapped the horse on the shoulder and said pull white horse pull then up sprang the horse at once and drew the lion away with him the lion began to roar so that all the birds in the forest flew out in terror but the horse let him roar and drew him and dragged him over the country to his master's door when the master saw the lion he was of a better mind and said to the horse thou shalt stay with me and farewell and he gave him plenty to eat until he died end of story one hundred and thirty two Story 133 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Shoes That Were Danced to Pieces. There was once upon a time a king who had twelve daughters, each one more beautiful than the other. They all slept together in one chamber in which their beds stood side by side, and every night when they were in them the king locked the door and bolted it. But in the morning when he unlocked the door, he saw that their shoes were worn out with dancing, and no one could find out how that had come to pass then the king caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever could discover where they danced at night should choose one of them for his wife and be king after his death but that whosoever came forward and had not discovered it within three days and nights should have forfeited his life it was not long before a king's son presented himself and offered to undertake the enterprise he was well received and in the evening was led into a room adjoining the princess's sleeping chamber. His bed was placed there, and he was to observe where they went and danced, and in order that they might do nothing secretly or go away to some other place, the door of their room was left open. But the eyelids of the prince grew heavy as lead, and he fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning all twelve had been to the dance, for their shoes were standing there with holes in the soles. On the second and third nights it fell out just the same, and then his head was struck off without mercy. Many others came after this and undertook the enterprise, but all forfeited their lives. Now it came to pass that a poor soldier, who had a wound and could serve no longer, found himself on the road to the town where the king lived. There he met an old woman who asked him where he was going. I hardly know myself, answered he, and added in jest, i had half a mind to discover where the princesses danced their shoes into holes and thus become king that is not so difficult said the old woman you must not drink the wine which will be brought to you at night and must pretend to be sound asleep with that she gave him a little cloak and said if you put on that you will be invisible and then you can steal after the twelve when the soldier had received this good advice, he went into the thing in earnest, took heart, went to the king, and announced himself as a suitor. He was as well received as the others, and royal garments were put upon him. He was conducted that evening at bedtime into the antechamber, and as he was about to go to bed, the eldest came and brought him a cup of wine. But he had tied a sponge under his chin and let the wine run down into it without drinking a drop. Then he lay down, and when he had lain a while, he began to snore, as if in the deepest sleep. The twelve princesses heard that, and laughed, and the eldest said, He, too, might as well have saved his life. With that they got up, opened wardrobes, presses, cupboards, and brought out pretty dresses, dressed themselves before the mirrors, sprang about, and rejoiced at the prospect of the dance. 
only the youngest said i know not how it is you are very happy but i feel very strange some misfortune is certainly about to befall us thou art a goose who art always frightened said the eldest hast thou forgotten how many kings sons have already come here in vain i had hardly any need to give the soldier a sleeping draught in any case the clown would not have wakened when they were all ready they looked carefully at the soldier but he had closed his eyes and did not move or stir so they felt themselves quite secure the eldest then went to her bed and tapped it it immediately sank into the earth and one after the other they descended through the opening the eldest going first the soldier who had watched everything tarried no longer put on his little cloak and went down last with the youngest halfway down the steps he just trod a little on her dress she was terrified at that and cried out what is that who is pulling my dress don't be so silly said the eldest you have caught it on a nail then they went all the way down and when they were at the bottom they were standing in a wonderfully pretty avenue of trees all the leaves of which were of silver and shone and glistened the soldier thought i must carry a token away with me and broke off a twig from one of them on which the tree cracked with a loud report the youngest cried out again something is wrong did you hear that crack but the eldest said it is a gun fired for joy because we have got rid of our prince so quickly after that they came into an avenue where all the leaves were of gold and lastly into a third where they were of bright diamonds he broke off a twig from each which made such a crack each time that the youngest started back in terror but the eldest still maintained that they were salutes they went on and came to a great lake whereon stood twelve little boats and in every boat sat a handsome prince all of whom were waiting for the twelve and each took one of them with him but the soldier seated himself by the youngest then her prince said i can't tell why the boat is so much heavier to-day i shall have to row with all my strength if i am to get it across what should cause that said the youngest but the warm weather i feel very warm too on the opposite side of the lake stood a splendid brightly lit castle from whence resounded the joyous music of trumpets and kettle drums they rode over there entered and each prince danced with the girl he loved but the soldier danced with them unseen and when one of them had a cup of wine in her hand he drank it up so that the cup was empty when she carried it to her mouth the youngest was alarmed at this but the eldest always made her be silent they danced there till three o'clock in the morning when all the shoes were danced into holes and they were forced to leave off the princes rowed them back again over the lake and this time the soldier seated himself by the eldest on the shore they took leave of their princes and promised to return the following night when they reached the stairs the soldier ran on in front and lay down in his bed and when the twelve had come up slowly and warily he was already snoring so loudly that they could all hear him and they said so far as he is concerned we are safe they took off their beautiful dresses laid them away put the worn-out shoes under the bed and lay down next morning the soldier was resolved not to speak but to watch the wonderful goings-on and again went with them then everything was done just as it had been done the first time and each time they danced till their shoes were worn to pieces but the third time he took a cup away with him as a token when the hour had arrived for him to give his answer he took the three twigs and the cup and went to the king but the twelve stood behind the door and listened for what he was going to say when the king put the question where have my twelve daughters danced their shoes into pieces in the night he answered in an underground castle with twelve princes and related how it had come to pass and brought out the tokens the king then summoned his daughters and asked them if the soldier had told the truth and when they saw that they were betrayed and that falsehood would be of no avail they were obliged to confess all thereupon the king asked which of them he would have to wife he answered i am no longer young so give me the eldest then the wedding was celebrated on the self-same day and the kingdom was promised him after the king's death but the princes were bewitched for as many days as they had danced nights with the twelve end of story 133
Story 134 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva K. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Six Servants. In former times, there lived an aged queen who was a sorceress, and her daughter was the most beautiful maiden under the sun. The old woman, however, had no other thought than how to lure mankind to destruction, and when a wooer appeared, she said that whosoever wished to have her daughter must first perform a task or die. Many had been dazzled by the daughter's beauty and had actually risked this but they never could accomplish what the old woman enjoined them to do, and then no mercy was shown. They had to kneel down, and their heads were struck off. A certain king's son, who had also heard of the maiden's beauty, said to his father, "'Let me go there. I want to demand her in marriage.' "'Never,' answered the king. "'If you were to go, it would be going to your death.' On this the son lay down and was sick unto death, and for seven years he lay there, and no physician could heal him. When the father perceived that all hope was over, with a heavy heart he said to him, "'Go thither and try your luck, for I know no other means of curing you.' When the son heard that, he rose from his bed and was well again and joyfully set out on his way." And it came to pass that as he was riding across a heath, he saw from afar something like a great heap of hay lying on the ground, and when he drew nearer, he could see that it was the stomach of a man who had laid himself down there, but the stomach looked like a small mountain. When the fat man saw the traveller, he stood up and said, "'If you are in need of any one, take me into your service.' The prince answered, "'What can I do with such a great big man?' "'Oh,' said the stout one, "'this is nothing. When I stretch myself out, well, I am three thousand times fatter.' "'If that's the case,' said the prince, "'I can make use of thee. Come with me.' So the stout one followed the prince, and after a while they found another man, who was lying on the ground with his ear laid to the turf." "'What art thou doing there?' asked the king's son. "'I am listening,' replied the man. "'What art thou listening to so attentively?' "'I am listening to what is just going on in the world, "'for nothing escapes my ears. "'I even hear the grass growing.' "'Tell me,' said the prince, "'what thou hearest at the court of the old queen "'who has the beautiful daughter.' "'Then he answered,' I hear the whizzing of the sword that is striking off a wooer's head. The king's son said, I can make use of thee, come with me. They went onwards and then saw a pair of feet lying and a part of a pair of legs, but could not see the rest of the body. When they had walked on for a great distance, they came to the body and at last to the head also. Why, said the prince, what a tall rascal thou art oh replied the tall one that is nothing at all yet when i really stretch out my limbs i am three thousand times as tall and taller than the highest mountain on earth i will gladly enter your service if you will take me come with me said the prince i can make use of thee they went onwards and found a man sitting by the road who had bound up his eyes. The prince said to him, Hast thou weak eyes that thou canst not look at the light? No, replied the man, but I must not remove the bandage, for whatsoever I look at with my eyes splits to pieces. My glance is so powerful. If you can use that, I shall be glad to serve you. Come with me, replied the king's son. I can make use of thee. 
they journeyed onwards and found a man who was lying in the hot sunshine trembling and shivering all over his body so that not a limb was still how canst thou shiver when the sun is shining so warm said the king's son alack replied the man i am of quite a different nature the hotter the sun is the colder i am and the frost pierces through all my bones and the colder it is the hotter i am in the midst of ice i cannot endure the heat nor in the midst of fire the cold thou art a strange fellow said the prince but if thou wilt enter my service follow me they travelled onwards and saw a man standing who made a long neck and looked about him and could see over all the mountains what art thou looking at so eagerly said the king's son the man replied i have such sharp eyes that i can see into every forest and field and hill and valley all over the world the prince said come with me if thou wilt for i am still in want of such an one and now the king's son and his six servants came to the town where the aged queen dwelt he did not tell her who he was but said if you will give me your beautiful daughter i will perform any task you set me the sorceress was delighted to get such a handsome youth as this into her net and said i will set thee three tasks and if thou art able to perform them all thou shalt be husband and master of my daughter what is the first to be thou shalt fetch me my ring which i have dropped into the red sea so the king's son went home to his servants and said the first task is not easy a ring is to be got out of the red sea come find some way of doing it then the man with the sharp sight said i will see where it is lying and looked down into the water and said it is sticking there on a pointed stone the tall one carried them thither and said i would soon get it out if i could only see it oh is that all cried the stout one and lay down and put his mouth to the water on which all the waves fell into it just as if it had been a whirlpool and he drank up the whole sea till it was dry as a meadow the tall one stooped down a little and brought out the ring with his hand then the king's son rejoiced when he had the ring and took it to the old queen she was astonished and said yes it is the right ring thou hast safely performed the first task but now comes the second dost thou see the meadow in front of my palace three hundred fat oxen are feeding there and these must thou eat skin hair bones horns and all and down below in my cellar lie three hundred casks of wine and these thou must drink up as well and if one hair of the oxen or one little drop of the wine is left thy life will be forfeited to me may i invite no guests to this repast inquired the prince no dinner is good without some company the old woman laughed maliciously and replied thou mayst invite one for the sake of companionship but no more the king's son went to his servants and said to the stout one thou shalt be my guest to-day and shalt eat thy fill hereupon the stout one stretched himself out and ate the three hundred oxen without leaving one single hair and then he asked if he was to have nothing but his breakfast he drank the wine straight from the casks without feeling any need of a glass and he licked the last drop from his finger nails when the meal was over the prince went to the old woman and told her that the second task also was performed she wondered at this and said no one has ever done so much before but one task still remains and she thought to herself thou shalt not escape me and wilt not keep thy head on thy shoulders this night said she i will bring my daughter to thee in thy chamber and thou shalt put thine arms round her 
but when you are sitting there together beware of falling asleep when twelve o'clock is striking i will come and if she is then no longer in thine arms thou art lost the prince thought the task is easy i will most certainly keep my eyes open nevertheless he called his servants told them what the old woman had said and remarked who knows what treasury lurks behind this foresight is a good thing keep watch and take care that the maiden does not go out of my room again when night fell the old woman came with her daughter and gave her into the prince's arms and then the tall one wound himself round the two in a circle and the stout one placed himself by the door so that no living creature could enter there the two sat and the maiden spoke never a word but the moon shone through the window on her face and the prince could behold her wondrous beauty he did nothing but gaze at her and was filled with love and happiness and his eyes never felt weary this lasted until eleven o'clock when the old woman cast such a spell over all of them that they fell asleep and at the self-same moment the maiden was carried away then they all slept soundly until a quarter to twelve when the magic lost its power and all awoke again o oh, misery and misfortune cried the prince now i am lost the faithful servants also began to lament but the listener said be quiet i want to listen then he listened for an instant and said she is on a rock three hundred leagues from hence bewailing her fate thou alone tall one canst help her if thou wilt stand up thou wilt be there in a couple of steps yes answered the tall one but the one with the sharp eyes must go with me that we may destroy the rock then the tall one took the one with the bandaged eyes on his back and in the twinkling of an eye they were on the enchanted rock the tall one immediately took the bandage from the other's eyes and he did but look round and the rock shivered into a thousand pieces then the tall one took the maiden in his arms carried her back in a second then fetched his companion with the same rapidity and before it struck twelve they were all sitting as they had sat before quite merrily and happily when twelve struck the aged sorceress came stealing in with a malicious face which seemed to say now he is mine for she believed that her daughter was on the rock three hundred leagues off but when she saw her in the prince's arms she was alarmed and said here is one who knows more than i do she dared not make any opposition and was forced to give him her daughter but she whispered in her ear it is a disgrace to thee to have to obey common people and that thou art not allowed to choose a husband to thine own liking on this the proud heart of the maiden was filled with anger and she meditated revenge next morning she caused three hundred great bundles of wood to be got together and said to the prince that though the three tasks were performed she would still not be his wife until some one was ready to seat himself in the midst of the wood and bear the fire she thought that none of his servants would let themselves be burned for him and that out of love for her he himself would place himself upon it and then she would be free but the servants said every one of us has done something except the frosty one he must set to work and they put him in the middle of the pile and set fire to it then the fire began to burn and burned for three days until all the wood was consumed and when the flames had burnt out the frosty one was standing amid the ashes trembling like an aspen leaf and saying i never felt such a frost during the whole course of my life if it had lasted much longer i should have been benumbed as no other pretext was to be found the beautiful maiden was now forced to take the unknown youth as a husband but when they drove away to church the old woman said i cannot endure this disgrace 
and sent her warriors after them with orders to cut down all who opposed them and bring back her daughter but the listener had sharpened his ears and heard the secret discourse of the old woman what shall we do said he to the stout one but he knew what to do and spat out once or twice behind the carriage some of the sea-water which he had drunk and a great sea arose in which the warriors were caught and drowned when the sorceress perceived that she sent her mailed knights but the listener heard the rattling of their armour and undid the bandage from one eye of sharp eyes who looked for a while rather fixedly at the enemy's troops on which they all sprang to pieces like glass then the youth and the maiden went on their way undisturbed and when the two had been blessed in church the six servants took leave and said to their master your wishes are now satisfied you need us no longer we will go our way and seek our fortunes half a league from the palace of the prince's father was a village near which a swineherd tended his herd and when they came thither the prince said to his wife do you know who i really am i am no prince but a herder of swine and the man who is there with that herd is my father we too shall have to set to work also and help him then he alighted with her at the inn and secretly told the innkeepers to take away her royal apparel during the night so when she awoke in the morning she had nothing to put on and the innkeeper's wife gave her an old gown and a pair of worsted stockings and at the same time seemed to consider it a great present and said if it were not for the sake of your husband i should have given you nothing at all then the princess believed that he really was a swineherd and tended the herd with him and thought to herself i have deserved this for my haughtiness and pride this lasted for a week and then she could endure it no longer for she had sores on her feet and now came a couple of people who asked if she knew who her husband was yes she answered he is a swineherd and has just gone out with cords and ropes to try to drive a little bargain but they said just come with us and we will take you to him and they took her up to the palace and when she entered the hall there stood her husband in kingly raiment but she did not recognize him until he took her in his arms kissed her and said i suffered much for thee and now thou too hast had to suffer for me and then the wedding was celebrated and he who has told you all this wishes that he too had been present at it end of story 134story 135 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melvin lee household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt the white bride and the black one a woman was going about the unenclosed land with her daughter and her stepdaughter cutting fodder when the lord came walking towards them in the form of a poor man and asked which is the way into the village if you want to know said the mother seek it for yourself and the daughter added if you are afraid you will not find it take a guide with you but the stepdaughter said poor man i will take you there come with me then god was angry with the mother and daughter and turned his back on them and wished that they should become as black as night and ugly as sin to the poor stepdaughter however god was gracious and went with her and when they were near the village he said a blessing over her and spake choose three things for thyself and i will grant them to thee then said the maiden i should like to be as beautiful and fair as the sun and instantly she was white and fair as day then I should like to have a purse of money which would never grow empty. That the Lord gave her also, but he said, 
do not forget what is best of all said she for my third wish i desire after my death to inhabit the eternal kingdom of heaven that also was granted unto her and then the lord left her when the stepmother came home with her daughter and they saw that they were both as black as coal and ugly but that the stepdaughter was white and beautiful wickedness increased still more in their hearts and they thought of nothing else but how they could do her an injury the stepdaughter however had a brother called regener whom she loved very much and she told him all that had happened once on a time regener said to her dear sister i will take thy likeness that i may continually see thee before mine eyes for my love for thee is so great that i should like always to look at thee then she answered but i pray thee let no one see the picture so he painted his sister and hung up the picture in his room he however dwelt in the king's palace for he was coachman every day he went and stood before the picture and thanked god for the happiness of having such a dear sister now it happened that the king whom he served had just lost his wife who had been so beautiful that no one could be found to compare with her and on this account the king was in deep grief the attendants about the court however remarked that the coachman stood daily before this beautiful picture and they were jealous of him so they informed the king then the latter ordered the picture to be brought to him and when he saw that it was like his lost wife in every respect except that it was still more beautiful he fell mortally in love with it he caused the coachman to be brought before him and asked whom the portrait represented the coachman said it was his sister so the king resolved to take no one but her as his wife and gave him a carriage and horses and splendid garments of cloth of gold and sent him forth to fetch his chosen bride when regener came on this errand his sister was glad but the black maiden was jealous of her good fortune and grew angry above all measure and said to her mother of what use are all your arts to us now when you cannot procure such a piece of luck for me be quiet said the old woman i will soon divert it to you and by her arts of witchcraft she so troubled the eyes of the coachman that he was half blind and she stopped the ears of the white maiden so that she was half deaf then they got into the carriage first the bride in her noble royal apparel then the stepmother with her daughter and regener sat on the box to drive when they had been on the way for some time the coachman cried cover thee well my sister dear that the rain may not wet thee that the wind may not load thee with dust that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king the bride asked what is my dear brother saying ah said the woman he says that you ought to take off your golden dress and give it to your sister and she took it off and put it on the black maiden who gave her in exchange for it a shabby gray gown they drove onwards and a short time afterwards the brother cried again cover thee well my sister dear that the rain may not wet thee that the wind may not load thee with dust that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king the bride asked what is my dear brother saying ah said the old woman he says that you ought to take off your golden hood and give it to your sister so she took off the hood and put it on her sister and sat with her own head uncovered and they drove on farther after a while the brother once more cried cover thee well my sister dear that the rain may not wet thee that the wind may not load thee with dust that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king the bride asked what is my dear brother saying ah said the old woman he says you must look out of the carriage they were however just on a bridge which crossed deep water when the bride stood up and leant forward out of the carriage they both pushed her out and she fell into the middle of the water at the same moment that she sank a snow-white duck arose out of the mirror-smooth water 
and swam down the river. The brother had observed nothing of it, and drove the carriage on until they reached the court. Then he took the black maiden to the king as his sister, and thought she really was so, because his eyes were dim, and he saw the golden garments glittering. When the king saw the boundless ugliness of his intended bride, he was very angry, and ordered the coachman to be thrown into a pit which was full of adders and nests of snakes. The old witch, however, knew so well how to flatter the king and deceive his eyes by her arts, that he kept her and her daughter until she appeared quite endurable to him, and he really married her. One evening, when the black bride was sitting on the king's knee, a white duck came swimming up the gutter to the kitchen, and said to the kitchen boy, Boy, light a fire that I may warm my feathers. The kitchen boy did it, and lighted a fire on the hearth. Then came the duck, and sat down by it, and shook herself, and smoothed her feathers to rights with her bill. When she was thus sitting and enjoying herself, she asked, What is my brother Regener doing? The scullery boy replied, He is imprisoned in the pit with adders and with snakes. Then she asked, What is the black witch doing in the house? The boy answered, She is loved by the king and happy. May God have mercy on him, said the duck, and swam forth by the sink. The next night she came again and put the same questions, and the third night also. Then the kitchen boy could bear it no longer and went to the king and discovered all to him. The king, however, wanted to see it for himself, and next evening went thither, and when the duck thrust her head in through the sink, he took his sword and cut through her neck, and suddenly she changed into a most beautiful maiden, exactly like the picture which her brother had made of her. The king was full of joy, and as she stood there quite wet, he caused splendid apparel to be brought, and had her clothed in it. Then she told how she had been betrayed by cunning and falsehood, and at last thrown into the water, and her first request was that her brother should be brought forth from the pit of snakes, and when the king had fulfilled this request, he went into the chamber where the old witch was, and asked, What does she deserve who does this and that? and related what had happened. Then was she so blinded that she was aware of nothing and said, She deserves to be stripped naked and put into a barrel with nails, and that a horse should be harnessed to the barrel, and the horse sent all over the world. All of which was done to her, and to her black daughter. But the king married the white and beautiful bride, and rewarded her faithful brother, and made him a rich and distinguished man. End of story 135。story 136 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by james walberg。Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Iron John There was once on a time a king who had a great forest near his palace, full of all kinds of wild animals. One day he sent out a huntsman to shoot him a row, but he did not come back. Perhaps some accident has befallen him, said the king, and the next day he sent out two more huntsmen who were to search for him but they too stayed away. Then on the third day he sent for all his huntsmen, and said, Scour the whole forest through, and do not give up until ye have found all three. But of these also none came home again, and of the pack of hounds which they had taken with them none were seen more. From that time forth no one would any longer venture into the forest, and it lay there in deep stillness and solitude, and nothing was seen of it, but sometimes an eagle or a hawk flying over it. This lasted for many years, when a strange huntsman announced himself to the king as seeking a situation, and offered to go to the dangerous woods. 
The king, however, would not give his consent, and said, It is not safe in there. I fear it would fare with thee no better than with the others, and thou wouldst never come out again. The huntsman replied, Lord, I will venture it at my own risk, of fear I know nothing. The huntsman therefore betook himself with his dog to the forest. It was not long before the dog fell in with some game on the way, and wanted to pursue it. But hardly had the dog run two steps when it stood before a deep pool and could go no farther, and a naked arm stretched itself out of the water, seized it, and drew it under. When the huntsman saw that, he went back and fetched three men to come with buckets and bail out the water. When they could see the bottom, there lay a wild man, whose body was brown like rusty iron, and whose hair hung over his face down to his knees. They bound him with cords and led him away to the castle. There was great astonishment over the wild man. The king, however, had him put in an iron cage in his courtyard, and forbade the door to be opened on pain of death, and the queen herself was to take the key into her keeping. And from this time forth, everyone could go into the forest again with safety. The king had a son of eight years, who was once playing in the courtyard, and while he was playing, his golden ball fell into the cage. The boy ran thither and said, Give me back my ball. Not till thou hast opened the door for me, answered the man. No, said the boy, I will not do that. The king has forbidden it, and ran away. The next day, again he went and asked for his ball. The wild man said, Open my door, but the boy would not. On the third day, the king had ridden out hunting, and the boy went once more and said, I cannot open the door even if I wished, for I have not the key. Then the wild man said, It lies under thy mother's pillow. Thou canst get it there. The boy, who wanted to have his ball back, cast all thought to the winds, and brought the key. The door opened with difficulty, and the boy pinched his fingers. When it was open, the wild man stepped out, gave him the golden ball, and hurried away. The boy had become afraid. He called and cried after him, O oh, wild man, do not go away, or I shall be beaten. The wild man turned back, took him up, set him on his shoulder, and went with hasty steps into the forest. When the king came home, he observed that the cage was empty, and asked the queen how that had happened. She knew nothing about it, and sought the key, but it was gone. She called the boy, but no one answered. The king sent out people to seek for him in the fields, but they did not find him. Then he could easily guess what had happened, and much grief reigned in the royal court. When the wild man had once more reached the dark forest, he took the boy down from his shoulder and said to him, Thou wilt never see thy father and mother again, but I will keep thee with me, for thou hast set me free, and I have compassion on thee. If thou dost all I bid thee, thou shalt fare well. Of treasure and gold I have enough, and more than any one in the world. He made a bed of moss for the boy on which he slept. And the next morning the man took him to a well, and said, Behold, the gold well is as bright and clear as crystal. Thou shalt sit beside it, and take care that nothing falls into it, or it will be polluted. I will come every evening to see if thou hast obeyed my order. The boy placed himself by the margin of the well, and often saw a golden fish or a golden snake show itself therein, and took care that nothing fell in. As he was thus sitting, his finger hurt him so violently that he involuntarily put it in the water. He drew it quickly out again, but saw that it was quite gilded, and whatsoever pains he took to wash the gold off again, all was to no purpose. In the evening, Iron John came back, looked at the boy, and said, What has happened to the well? Nothing, he answered, and held his finger behind his back, that the man might not see it. But he said, Thou hast dipped thy finger into the water. This time it may pass, but take care that dost now again let anything go in. By daybreak the boy was already sitting by the well and watching it. His finger hurt him again, and he passed it over his head, 
and then unhappily a hare fell down into the well. He took it quickly out, but it was already quite gilded. Iron John came and already knew what had happened. Thou hast let a hare fall into the well, he said. I will allow thee to watch it once more, but if this happens for the third time, then the well is polluted, and thou canst no longer remain with me. On the third day, the boy sat by the well and did not stir his finger, however much it hurt him. But the time was long to him, and he looked at the reflection of his face on the surface of the water. And as he still bent down more and more while he was doing so, and trying to look straight into the eyes, his long hair fell down from his shoulders into the water. He raised himself up quickly, but the whole of the hair of his head was already golden and shone like the sun. You may imagine how terrified the poor boy was. He took his pocket handkerchief and tied it round his head in order that the man might not see it. When he came, he already knew everything and said, Take the handkerchief off. Then the golden hair streamed forth and let the boy excuse himself as he might. It was of no use. Thou hast not stood the trial and canst not stay here no longer. Go forth into the world. There thou wilt learn what poverty is. But as thou hast not a bad heart, and as I mean well by thee, there is one thing I will grant thee. If thou fallest into any difficulty, come to the forest and cry, Iron John, and then I will come and help thee. My power is great, greater than thou thinkest, and I have gold and silver in abundance. Then the king's son left the forest and walked by beaten and unbeaten paths ever onwards until at length he reached a great city. There he looked for work, but could find none, and he had learnt nothing by which he could help himself. At length he went to the palace, and asked if they would take him in. The people about court did not at all know what use they could make of him, but they liked him, and told him to stay. At length the cook took him into his service, and said he might carry wood and water, and rake the cinders together. Once, when it so happened that no one else was at hand, the cook ordered him to carry the food to the royal table, but as he did not like to let his golden hair be seen, he kept his little cap on. Such a thing as that had never yet come under the king's notice, and he said, When thou comest to the royal table, thou must take thy hat off. He answered, Ah, oh, Lord, I cannot. I have a bad sore place on my head. Then the king had the cook called before him and scolded him, and asked how he could take such as a boy as that into his service and that he was to turn him off at once. The cook, however, had pity on him, and exchanged him for the gardener's boy. And now the boy had to plant and water the garden, and hoe and dig and bear the wind and bad weather. Once in summer he was working alone in the garden. The day was so warm he took his little cap off that the air might cool him. As the sun shone on his hair it glittered and flashed so that the rays fell into the bedroom of the king's daughter and up she sprang to see what that could be. Then she saw the boy and cried to him, Boy, bring me a wreath of flowers. He put his cap on with all haste, and gathered wild field flowers and bound them together. When he was ascending the stairs with them, the gardener met him and said, How canst thou take the king's daughter a garland of such common flowers? Go quickly and get another, and seek out the prettiest and the rarest. Oh, no, replied the boy. The wild ones have more scent, and will please her better. When he got into the room, the king's daughter said, Take thy cap off. It is not seemly to keep it on in my presence. He said again, I may not. I have a sore head. She, however, caught at his cap and pulled it off, and then his golden hair rolled down his shoulders, and it was splendid to behold. He wanted to run out, but she held him by the arm and gave him a handful of ducats. With those he departed but he cared nothing for the gold pieces. He took them to the gardener and said, I present them to thy children. They can play with them. The following day the king's daughter again called to him that he was to bring her a wreath of field flowers, and when he went in with it, she instantly snatched at his cap and wanted to take it away from him, but he held it fast with both hands. She again gave him a handful of ducats, but he would not keep them, and gave them to the gardener for playthings for his children. On the third day, things went just the same. She could not get his cap away from him, and he would not have her money. Not long afterwards, 
the country was overrun by war. The king gathered together his people, and did not know whether or not he could offer any opposition to the enemy, who was superior in strength and had a mighty army. Then said the gardener's boy, I am grown up, and will go to the wars also. Only give me a horse. The others laughed and said, Seek one for thyself when we are gone. We will leave one behind us in the stable for thee. When they had gone forth, he went into the stable and got the horse out. It was lame of one foot and limped hobbledy-jig, hobbledy-jig. Nevertheless, he mounted it and rode away to the dark forest. When he came to the outskirts, he called, Iron John, three times so loudly that it echoed through the trees. Thereupon, the wild man appeared immediately and said, What dost thou desire? I want a strong steed, for I am going to the wars. That thou shalt have, and still more than thou askest for. Then the wild man went back into the forest, and it was not long before a stable boy came out of it, who led a horse that snorted with its nostrils, and could hardly be restrained, and behind them followed a great troop of soldiers, entirely equipped in iron, and their swords flashed in the sun. The youth made over his three-legged horse to the stable boy, mounted the other, and rode at the head of the soldiers. When he got near the battlefield, a great part of the king's men had already fallen, and little was wanting to make the rest give way. Then the youth galloped thither with his iron soldiers, broke like a hurricane over the enemy, and beat down all who opposed him. They began to fly, but the youth pursued and never stopped, until there was not a single man left. Instead, however, of returning to the king, he conducted his troop by byways back to the forest, and called forth Iron John. "'What dost thou desire?' asked the wild man. "'Take back thy horse and thy troops, and give me my three-legged horse again.' All that he asked was done, and soon he was riding on his three-legged horse. When the king returned to his palace, his daughter went to meet him, and wished him joy of his victory. I am not the one who carried away the victory, said he, but a stranger knight who came to my assistance with his soldiers. The daughter wanted to hear who the strange knight was, but the king did not know, and said, He followed the enemy, and I did not see him again. She inquired of the gardener where his boy was, but he smiled and said, He has just come home on his three-legged horse, and the others have been mocking him, crying, Here comes our hobbledy jig back again. They asked too, under what hedge hast thou been sleeping all the time? He, however, said, I did the best of all, and it would have gone badly without me. And then he was still more ridiculed. The king said to his daughter, I will proclaim a great feast that shall last for three days, and thou shalt throw a golden apple. Perhaps the unknown will come to it. When the feast was announced, the youth went out to the forest and called Iron John. What dost thou desire? asked he that I may catch the king's daughter's golden apple. It is as safe as if thou hast it already, said Iron John. Thou shalt likewise have a suit of red armor for the occasion, and ride on a spirited chestnut horse. When the day came, the youth galloped to the spot, took his place amongst the knights, and was recognized by no one. The king's daughter came forward and threw a golden apple to the knights, but none of them caught it but he. As soon as he had it, he galloped away. On the second day, Iron John equipped him as a white knight and gave him a white horse. Again, he was the only one who caught the apple, and he did not linger an instant, but galloped off with it. The king grew angry and said, That is not allowed. He must appear before me and tell his name. He gave the order that if the knight who caught the apple should go away again, they should pursue him, and if he would not come back willingly, they were to cut him down and stab him. On the third day, he received from Iron John a suit of black armor and a black horse, and again he caught the apple. But when he was riding off with it, the king's attendants pursued him, and one of them got so near him that he wounded the youth's leg with the point of his sword. The youth nevertheless escaped from them, but his horse leapt so violently that the helmet fell from the youth's head, and they could see he had golden hair. They rode back and announced this to the king. The following day, the king's daughter asked the gardener about his boy. He is at work in the garden. The queer creature has been at the festival, too. He only came home yesterday evening. 
he has likewise shown my children three golden apples which he has won the king had him summoned into his presence and he came and again had his little cap on his head but the king's daughter went up to him and took it off and his golden hair fell down over his shoulders and he was so handsome that all were amazed art thou the knight who came every day to the festival always in different colors and who caught the three golden apples asked the king yes answered he and here the apples are and he took them out of his pocket and returned them to the king if you desire further proof you may see the wound which your people gave me when they followed me but i am likewise the knight who helped you to your victory over your enemies if thou canst perform such deeds as that thou art no gardener's boy tell me who is thy father my father is a mighty king and gold i have in plenty as great as i require i well see said the king that i owe thanks to thee can i do anything to please thee yes answered he that indeed you can give me your daughter to wife the maiden laughed and said he does not much stand on ceremony but i already seen by his golden hair that he was no gardener's boy and then she went and kissed him his father and mother came to the wedding and were in great delight for they had given up all hope of ever seeing their dear son again and as they were sitting at the marriage feast the music suddenly stopped the doors opened and a stately king came in with a great retinue he went up to the youth embraced him and said i am iron john and was by enchantment a wild man but thou hast set me free and all the treasures which i possess shall be thy property end of story 136